Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can all hear me well. If not, just type into the chat that you're having problems hearing me, and we will correct the situation. My name is Mark Ramos, and I am an associate professor in the School of Public Health and Health Systems at the University of Waterloo. I'm also an associate scientific director for the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, and I'm going to be hosting today's installment of the CLSA webinar series. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Mark Teaser. Mark completed his undergraduate medical and postgraduate adult neurology training at McGill, and after he completed his medical training, he also completed an MSc in epidemiology uh, under the supervision of Tina Wolfson, who is one of the CLS APIs, and to complete this degree, he was supported by a Fonds de Recherche du Québec Santé Bursary. Uh, he is currently a clinical research fellow at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery um, in the United Kingdom, and uh, he is working under the auspices of the International Sponsorship Scheme of the Royal College of Physicians of London. Mark's professional interests include several aspects of epilepsy research, including methods of case ascertainment, uh, comorbid conditions and premature mortality, and also the treatment gap in epilepsy surgery. Uh, this webinar, the identification of adults with epilepsy in population-based studies, is going to describe some of Mark's work in developing a new screening instrument to identify adults with epilepsy. I think this is the first presentation where our presenter is actually out of the country and also uh, not on the continent of North America. I believe Mark is presently in London to give this presentation. So uh, it's about six hours later. So thank you very much, Mark, for um, accommodating us and the international time zones. The presentation will be approximately 40 to 45 minutes. We'll then have 10 to 15 minutes worth of questions. So, Mark, I turn things over to you. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, I hope everyone can hear me all right. So, uh, yes, thank you, Mark, uh, for uh, the introduction. And uh, thank you, of course, for inviting me to uh, speak. Uh, I was going to say this evening, but uh, this afternoon, uh, uh, back in Canada. So the title of my uh, talk today is, is the identification of adults with epilepsy in population-based studies. Uh, this is work that I did uh, during the course of my MSc in epidemiology that I did with uh, Tina Wolfson at McGill. So this is of course a talk uh, that uh, involves a lot uh, about uh, population-based research. I think a nice way of highlighting why uh, population-based research is important is to talk about uh, the clinician's fallacy. This is the uh, assumption that one can truly understand a disease by only studying individuals that present medical attention. Of course, as you can imagine, this results in an iceberg phenomenon, the idea where you'll, you can, you'll see what is above the surface, but you may miss what could be a lot of things underneath the surface. In epidemiological terms, there are, of course, related risks of selection bias, and at the very least, limited generalizability. So population-based research is important, but of course when you start engaging in this type of research, there are additional challenges. In the context of a clinic, it's generally very easy, well, relatively easy to understand who has or does not have a disease. It's re usually relatively easy to apply your gold standard to all the participants in the study. You're usually, you're often talking at least about dozens or maybe hundreds of people. But in the context of large population-based studies, you could be talking about tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. And so applying your gold standard to all these individuals would obviously be impractical. So you have to use some sort of surrogate for your gold standard. That's, of course, a validated screening instrument. In the context of epilepsy, this often takes the form, or this almost invariably takes the form, in fact, of a questionnaire. So this is the outline of my talk today. Uh, the first part is going to try to be uh, a quite, I guess, longer than it, it would usually be background section, because I know that this is a mixed audience, and so I wanted to make sure that I address at least some fundamental concepts uh, 
concepts that I'll be talking about throughout this talk. And then, as I mentioned before, this is talk will then the meat of this talk will be a lot about uh, work that I did during my master's thesis. And so I'll be talking like uh, I'll be talking about a systematic review that we conducted during that thesis. Then I'll talk about how we use what we learned during that systematic review to uh, design a new case ascertainment algorithm, questionnaire and algorithm, one that we uh, subsequently entitled the CLSA epilepsy algorithm. And then finally, uh, I'll talk about uh, work that we did in validating this algorithm. So background. So of course, this is a talk on epilepsy in large part. So I wanted to define a few simple terms, well, fundamental terms. So in terms of the di uh, definition of epilepsy, the definition can be, you know, it's quite long, a full definition. But I think the heart of it revolves around this concept that it is an enduring predisposition to generate recurrent, unprovoked epileptic seizures. Essentially, what distinguishes someone with epilepsy and someone without epilepsy is not whether they have an epileptic seizure, it's whether they have this underlying predisposition that at any that at some point they may have a, a seizure, in a sense, out of the blue. What is an epileptic seizure? Well, what's important to understand is that it's a transient occurrence that is uh, of clinical signs and symptoms related to an abnormal, excessive, or synchronous neuronal activity of the brain. Of course, this is talk about epilepsy, but also about screening questionnaires in epilepsy. And when we're talking about screening questionnaires, it's important to understand how we can validate these questionnaires, how we can understand how well they, in fact, perform. Measures of this test validity, of criterion validity, are the, the basic measures are sensitivity and specificity. A nice way of understanding them, and I'll see if I can get my pointer to work, is by using a, what I have here, a two by two contingency table. Sensitivity can be defined as the probability that someone with the disease has a positive test. While specificity is defined as someone without the disease who has a negative test. In terms of screening instruments for uh, epilepsy, there are examples that have been used in the past. There are examples that have been used in Canada. The National Population Health Survey and the Community Health Survey, there are two large um, Canadian studies uh, which are uh, which are ongoing, uh, which have used different uh, epilepsy screening questions. You see here the question for the NPHS and the question for the CHS. What's important to understand, however, is that these are questions, in fact, have not been validated. So, in fact, we don't, unfortunately, know the sensitivity and specificity. What we do know is that in relatively similar questions, uh, this question, which has been validated by the reference you see down here, Ruth Altman at Columbia University in New York, has, has in fact been shown to have a sensitivity of only 76%. In other words, if you were to ask 100 people uh, with epilepsy this question, 24 would say no. I think this is the reason why we should uh, be cautious when we're using what we, uh, single questions to try and identify people with epilepsy. I think it's important to point out that this doesn't seem to be a problem that's specific to epilepsy, that's only in epilepsy. In fact, it's difficult. It can be single item uh, questionnaires that the, these can pose. Uh, these are not necessarily very accurate in, in other diseases as well. If you ask uh, people with Parkinson's disease, this first question here, in fact, the sensitivity has been found to be only 89%. And if you ask people with a migraine this question here, the sensitivity has only been found to be 76%. So this is a problem uh, that can be found with many disorders. So I'm trying to illustrate some of the, challenge, the challenges that you can find when you're trying to study epilepsy in the general population. And I've compared it to some other disease. I've just now compared it to some of the challenges in other diseases. One thing that is a little bit more particular to epilepsy has to do with this concept of absorbing states. So absorbing states are it's actually just a general statistical term uh, stating that an, an absorbing state is one that once it occurs, once done, it cannot be undone. In the context of disease, an absorbing state is one that cannot be cured versus a non-absorbing state, which is one that can be cured. So for example, Parkinson's disease, I think quite obviously, 
idiopathic Parkinson's disease is an absorbing state. Once someone has, par uh, has Parkinson's disease, like they'll always have it. Epilepsy, however, it's not, that is not necessarily the case. So you may have epilepsy when you are 10 years old, but when you're 60 years old, you may no longer have epilepsy. So this actually adds an extra sort of level of complexity to its study. To illustrate this a bit, I just wanted to bring you back to these questions that I showed you at the beginning. Uh, well, not at the beginning, but just earlier. Here are the uh, two questions, the one that was used by the NPHS and the one by the CHS. And you see that in their question, they ask whether you have epilepsy. Right, so they use a present tense. So in fact, what they're measuring is active epilepsy. Whereas the Ottman question, uh, yes, the Ottman question, which I showed you, um, the one with the sensitivity of only 76%, she used the, t uh, the verb had. So in fact, she was asking whether you not only have epilepsy now, but whether you've ever had it in the past. So this is measuring something that's quite different. So this is measuring the, life, oops, the lifetime history of epilepsy. Just to put to, to sort of describe the importance of this distinction, it helps to know that in terms of prevalence, that generally the prevalence of a lifetime history of epilepsy is about twice that of active epilepsy. So understanding the distinguishing between the two is important. So this is a talk about studying epilepsy in uh, the general population. Of course, the motivation for me, the motivation for this, the work that I'm going to present to you soon, was the Canadian Long Student Study on Aging. Of course, given the context of this talk, I presume that most of you uh, know quite a bit about the CLSA. Just to summarize it briefly for those of you who are not as familiar with it, this is a very large, ambitious uh, project uh, that was started a few years ago. First started uh, recruiting the participants in 2012 whose goal is to recruit 50,000 people. This goal has almost been achieved, uh, or may have been achieved since the last I'd heard, who uh, were aged between 45 and 85 years old at the time of recruitment, who will then be followed for the next 20 years, during which they will undergo regular assessments, either telephone interviews, in-home uh, interviews, or um, more comprehensive assessments in a data collection site. Like uh, most uh, large population studies. Uh, there was, of course, great effort put into designing the questionnaires uh, for the study, but more at a, let's say, macro level. That, of course, as you can imagine, when you have hundreds and hundreds of questions, you cannot possibly go through and validate every single item. There have been more recent efforts, and this is a paper that was published by our moderator, Marco Ramos, uh, just a few years ago. Uh, where they validated seven different algorithms for seven different diseases. Uh, there was neuro one neurological condition in included in this, uh, one uh, for Parkinson's disease, an algorithm for Parkinson's disease. Presently in the CLSA, there is, uh, however, there remains just a single question for, presently I should say, up until this summer, there is a single a question for epilepsy. The question is, has a doctor ever told you that you have epilepsy? And so if we compare this to that Ottman question, we would wonder, although we're not, we can't say for sure, but we would wonder whether the sensitivity of this question is, again, only in the 70s or so, 70% or so. Mm -hmm. within, the neurological, within the, sorry, the CLSA, there is this Neurological Conditions Initiative. So this is a, um, a study that, uh, for which uh, Christina Wilson is the uh, principal investigator. The, the idea behind this was to augment uh, the investigation of neurological diseases within the CLSA to maximize uh, sort of uh, their investigation. Part of that, of course, is improving uh, the way in which neurological conditions uh, are identified. So that brings me, I suppose, to the meat of this talk. So I want to begin with a systematic review that we uh, carried out looking at previously validated epilepsy screening questionnaires. So I'm going to go over relatively quickly here. Uh, if you are interested in uh, learning more about it, of course, it, uh, it was recently published in Epilepsy uh, just uh, towards the end of last year. To describe it briefly, so this was a systematic review of uh, diagnostic uh, slash screening studies. And our, elig our eligibility criteria for studies to be included in this 
were relatively uh, straightforward. We were looking for studies that measured the sensitivity and specificity of non-physician administered uh, screening questionnaires in adults. We were open to uh, questionnaires that had been validated in either population or hospital-based cohorts, uh, questionnaires that had been administered either over the telephone or in person. We kept our search strategy relatively, given the resources we had at the time, we kept our search strategy relatively well limited to, to two databases, the two major databases, of course, Medline and Embase. We did not have any language restrictions. And we assessed quality using the Quadus 2 tool uh, as recommended by the Cochrane uh, group. We did not perform any meta-analyses. Uh, there's simply too much heterogeneity um, in uh, between these studies, as I'll show you in a moment. We did not perform any formal statistical tests for heterogeneity or publication bias either, in case you're wondering. For those of you who are wondering, uh, simply because I, you know, my, you know, my feeling, and I think what a lot of people have written about, is how these have really been uh, designed and validated for use in uh, reviews uh, of trials, not for observational studies, not for diagnostic studies, that they have to be used with great caution outside of trials, um, that there are other ways of looking for heterogeneity in diagnostic studies. Uh, more descriptive ways, of course, but still. And that for publication bias, when it comes to diagnostic studies, I think the safest assumption, the safest thing is to simply assume that there is publication bias. In fact, whenever you're looking at observational studies, assume there is publication bias, irrespective of what uh, a funnel plot or an Eggers test may tell you. So here is the uh, sort of the results of our search uh, in, uh, for the systematic review. We identified initially 917 articles. After uh, which went through two uh, oops, two levels of screening here, uh, and we finally ended up with uh, nine uh, studies, nine validation studies, six which looked at the lifetime history of epilepsy, and uh, three that looked at active epilepsy. Here is our um, table of study characteristics, and I hope yours isn't uh, sort of blocked out by this toolbar like mine is, but uh, I'll assume it isn't. Uh, I won't go through all the details of this table. It's a very busy table, I understand. One thing I did want to point out is highlighted by this asterisk. Um, the study by Altman. So I, this is a study that stood out to us for several reasons. First of all, of course, we, all of this work was being done with the CLSA in mind. Of course, the CLSA is being administered in two languages, English and French. And so the Altman, first of all, was one of the few validation studies that was actually done in English. It's a bit surprising considering how much of the literature is in English now, uh, but it was one of the few. It was also one of the few that had been validated in the population-based uh, cohort. And of these, it was the one that uh, then at the same time had the highest sensitivity and specificity, a sensitivity of 95.8%. It's quite good, it's quite good, better than the others at least. Uh, so this certainly piqued our interest. One of the thing, another thing that stood out about the Altman tool was that uh, in terms of its quality, the quality of this validation study was quite good. Here I should, I was about to say hi, but I should specify that anything in red here in this table is not good. Uh, that means a high risk of bias or an unclear risk of bias or a high a risk of, uh, or high um, issues with pro uh, applicability. So in fact, Altman, uh, again marked by an asterisk, had one of the best quality assessments of the, all of the validation studies. So again, another thing that caught our attention. So for this uh, study, we concluded that we had identified nine validation studies. Uh, in the paper, uh, we talk about various uh, sources of heterogeneity uh, between the different studies uh, involving not only the, uh, the, the, the populations in which these the tools were validated, but also the, the questionnaires themselves, of course, there was very few of these questionnaires where um, the same questionnaire was used in different studies. It generally, it was a new questionnaire every single time. And even the, the target condition was different, right? Uh, active epilepsy versus lifetime history of epilepsy. That there are concerns about uh, study quality in the majority of studies. But there did seem to be a possible advantage uh, with the Altman study. 
And so this led us to uh, this sort of uh, this brings me to uh, to how we started then to uh, design our own questionnaire and algorithm that we call now the uh, CLSA epilepsy algorithm. So in fact, what we did is uh, we tried to learn from the past. So we used here you have the uh, Altman uh, questionnaire. We have the questionnaire, and I'll talk in a minute about what I mean by algorithm. So these are the questionnaire. This is, these are the questions that Altman used and validated in uh, her study. You see here question number two is the one that I described before. Uh, the one uh, asking, have you ever had uh, a seizure disorder or epilepsy? The one that was shown to have sensitivity of 76%. Uh, there were other questions, uh, ones that asked about history of febrile convulsions, and then these, what we've called the symptom-based questions, where these don't ask whether you have epilepsy or not, but these are instead asking about whether you had symptoms that could be suggestive of epilepsy. Things like, do you have unusual spells? Or have you had, where is it, somewhere to ask whether you have spacing out when you were younger, similar things. That's the questionnaire that they used. What I've been using the term algorithm uh, a few number, uh, quite a bit already, and I suppose it's about time that I define what I mean. So the questionnaire are the questions that you ask to the individual. The algorithm is what you use to figure out what a test, positive test actually is. Right? If you only have one question in your questionnaire, then it's very easy to figure out what a positive test is. You say, well, if they answer yes to my one question, then that's a positive test. If you have multiple questions, you have to decide what is your threshold to say that overall it's positive. You say that if they answer yes to two of the questions, that's good enough. Do they have to answer to three of the questions, and that's good enough? Do they have to answer to one, this one here, and then one of these, whatever combination you may come up with. That's the algorithm. That's how you decide what a test, a positive test is. So the one that uh, Ruth Altman, uh, Altman's group, they uh, used a number, number of different definitions of a uh, positive test. The one that seems to have performed the best was when they used this one, where they said, where they, uh, well, they said they decided that an affirmative response to any of these questions, any one of these questions, was sufficient to say that the screen was positive. And that was the algorithm that they used. And this is the sensitivity that they found using that. I haven't been talking about specificity in the context of the test, because in fact, uh, context of the study, because in fact they didn't report specificity. Uh, they talk about false positive rates and so forth, but uh, it's a bit complicated. And I, I, I don't think I have time now to go into that. So this is what they had done. So our goals with the epilepsy, the CLSA epilepsy algorithm, we had five major goals. One was to uh, distinguish between active and lifetime history of epilepsy. The Altman questionnaire only uh, identifies those with a lifetime history. It does not identify those with active epilepsy. We also wanted to add a certain level of complexity to the a, a positive screen. We wanted to, uh, uh, excuse me, we wanted to um, be able to distinguish uh, between levels of certainty in the screen. So we wanted to distinguish between probable and suspect epilepsy. In the end, what we, what we wanted to be able to say is that if you said yes to the I have epilepsy question, that meant you had probable epilepsy. But if you said no to that question, but said yes to something like, say, I have unusual spells, that that didn't mean you had, we should uh, distinguish that from probable epilepsy. Instead, we should call that suspect epilepsy to reflect the fact that we're a little bit less certain about uh, whether you have epilepsy or not. We wanted to incorporate uh, the use of anti-epileptic drugs into the algorithm to see what effect that would have on the performance of the uh, algorithm. We, of course, given the context of the CLSA, we wanted to develop a French language instrument. And then finally, we wanted to have a priori algorithms. We wanted to have a priori definitions of uh, screen positives to try and minimize post uh, biases that can happen with post hoc analysis. This is still, of course, an explorative uh, study to a large degree, but we wanted to try and do something to control that. So here is the English language questionnaire that we used. You'll see that this, oops, let's see that. 
this first question and all of these uh, symptom-based questions are directly from Ottman, the questionnaire that I've already shown you. This question is also one that was described by Ottman. Uh, it wasn't part of the primary questionnaire, but was part of sort of a secondary questionnaire. And these down here are uh, the ones that we uh, added to uh, distinguish between active and inactive epilepsy. That's a questionnaire that we use. And these are the algorithms that we had that we wanted to test. So um, our ways of defining a uh, positive screen, in other words. I'll go through these uh, relatively quickly, but I hope I'll be able to explain them uh, relatively clearly. <laughs> so uh, for, we'll use, there are two of them, two versions, CLS EA1 and CLS EA2. So for CLS EA1, it begins with the self-report diagnosis question. So this is the, do you, have you ever had uh, epilepsy or seizure disorder? If you respond in the affirmative to that question, then the next step in the algorithm is your response to the anti-epileptic drug question. If you also respond in the affirmative to that question, then according to the algorithm, you'll be classified as probable epilepsy. So you said yes to epilepsy, yes to drugs for epilepsy, and so you probably have epilepsy. If you say yes to epilepsy but no to the drug question, then that causes us some uncertainty. And so we, instead of classifying you as probable epilepsy, we classify you as suspect epilepsy. This is where we incorporated the symptom-based questions. These are individuals. This part of the algorithm, you only come to this part of the algorithm if you say no to the epilepsy question. So if you say no to the epilepsy question, but yes to, for example, you suffer from unusual spells, we don't, we're unwilling to say that you have probable epilepsy, but we're willing to say you have suspect epilepsy. And then, of course, if you say no to everything, you have no epilepsy. That explains this sort of top level above this line of the algorithm. The level that's below here is uh, designed to distinguish uh, between those with active and inactive disease. So this is where we ask those questions about whether you've had a seizure within the last five years or uh, whether you're currently on anti-epileptic drugs. The CLSA2, EA2, is an, sort of an alternative to this first one with a uh, relatively modest change, but one that we thought could have a difference could have a significant impact on the results. If the difference is really here. In the CLS EA1, uh, if you say no to the epilepsy question, the best, the most you'll ever be considered is suspect epilepsy. For the CLS EA2, even if you say no to the epilepsy question, if you do say yes to one of the symptom-based questions and also yes to the drug question, then you will be classified as probable epilepsy. This is a different way of defining uh, test positive, the positive test. Of course, once we had developed all this, we needed to translate it. Uh, and so this is done using basic, uh, I think, standard uh, cross-cultural translation techniques where one translator translated the English questions uh, into French, a second translator translated it from French to English, and then all three were compared uh, by a bilingual investigator that was myself. And here are those French language questions. And so, of course, then the final part of this is uh, the validation of the uh, CLSAEA, the epilepsy algorithm. This too uh, was recently published in Epilepsy. We found it in, uh, it was published uh, towards the end of last year. So to go over very briefly, well, relatively briefly, so our goal, of course, was to uh, validate this in, a, uh, in the CLSA, using CLSA participants, uh, because uh, so much has gone into ensuring that they are a representative, a random representative sample of the general population. <clears throat> and so we began by recruiting uh, participants that were part of the regular CLSA cohort, as well as uh, participants that were part of the uh, CLSA pilot recruited uh, consecutive student state participants uh, you know, in terms of the or we recruited them in the order in which they had been initially recruited into the CLSA. Uh, although we did use some stratified sampling to try and create some balance between English and French speaking participants. 
we soon, of course, uh, discovered or understood the, uh, the limitations of our <laughs> resources and uh, the fact that the prevalence of epilepsy in the general population is relatively low. And so if we limit ourselves to CLSA participants, it would have been very difficult to get the kind of numbers necessary to find to have enough uh, participants with epilepsy. And so we had to use an extra sort of source of participants. These are the MNI, the Montreal Neurological Institute participants. What we did is we drew, we recruited individuals from what we termed an epilepsy enriched general neurology clinic at the MNI. This is basically a clinic where uh, Although a lot of the patients, I, should, I guess in this context I should say, uh, do have epilepsy, not all of them have epilepsy. That had certain advantages uh, for us, as I'll explain in a second. To go through how we administered, how we carried out the study, uh, for the CLSA participants, they were uh, telephoned, they were recruited, they were invited to come to the Montreal data collection site. When they arrived, they were consented, and then the questions of the, from the questionnaire were administered by a uh, research assistant. It was important that this research assistant was entirely unaware of whether the person had epilepsy or not. This was done to minimize interviewer bias, of course. Then, following that, they were referred to me. I acted as the reference standard, or sort of like the gold standard. Uh, and I would, uh, using general neurological, uh, carrying out a uh, standard uh, history and uh, physical examination is necessary, I would determine whether the person in fact had, ep had epilepsy or not. It was important that I was unaware of uh, the results of the questionnaire at this point in order to avoid what's been referred to as verification bias, to make sure that I'm not influenced by the results of the questionnaire. We did carry out a small reliability study uh, to ensure that looking at the quality of my diagnoses, comparing them uh, to that of, Nali, uh, of another neurologist, Natalie Jete, found that there was perfect agreement between, uh, between our diagnoses, between us. The participants seen with the neuro, uh, it was a similar process, but here instead of being seen by the neurologist, for, uh, by the um, research assistant first, they were uh, seen by the neurologist first. Uh, the neurologist was, of course, uh, unaware of the results of the questionnaire because it hadn't been carried out yet. They were then, after being consented, uh, they were referred to a research assistant who administered the questionnaire. Again, it was what was important here was that we did our best to uh, ensure that the interviewer was unaware of the uh, epilepsy status of the individual. Uh, so this is why it was good to have a general neurology clinic so that there is still some doubt in the interviewer's mind whether the person had epilepsy or not. Interviewer bias is, of course, that when you're administering a questionnaire, if you know the person ha has the disease, in our case epilepsy, it may influence the way you ask the questions. Here are the uh, participant characteristics. Uh, so we ended up uh, yeah, recruiting 242 individuals, 34 of whom here we are, had epilepsy and a hundred, sorry, 208 of whom did not have epilepsy. You see also that the vast majority, 33 of the people, of the individuals with epilepsy came from the MNI. Here's our flow diagram just showing uh, the breakdown of the participants and how uh, things went, I suppose. Um, you see here the number of participants that were uh, approached who uh, we attempted to recruit. There were a number who refused. We had a participation rate of about 85%, just above 85%, our 242 individuals. I won't go through the rest of the flow diagram, but it was said, show you our results. So this is a, a summary table uh, showing uh, the um, sensitivity and specificity estimates, as well, uh, as well as predictive values, but I won't talk about that, um, at least not here. Uh, for uh, the questionnaire and algorithm, see here lifetime history of epilepsy versus whether it was try we were using it to detect or identify people with active epilepsy. Um, and what we found was that the CLS EA2, using probable only as our definition of a screen positive, had uh, the highest sensitivity and specificity 
for both lifetime history and active epilepsy. To illustrate, to, to remind you of what that actually means, it means that the CLSA2 appeared the one to be the one that performed better when better than the CLSEA1 when we uh, considered probable epilepsy only as our definition of a screen positive. So basically if you were in this part of the oops, in this this part of the algorithm, you were considered positive as per the questionnaire. And if you were anywhere in here, it was a negative screen. We found that using it this way, it performed the best. There's a few final observations. Uh, so uh, we did compare how people using this English language questionnaires versus the French language questionnaire performed. We did not find any differences in the sensitivity and the specificity between these two groups. It is important to highlight that this study is at risk of spectrum effects because of our because we used participants uh, that were not from the general population because we used people from an MNI. Such a spectrum effects essentially is this idea that uh, whenever you're testing how well a te uh, testing, <laughs> how well a test performs, if you, all you use is very sick individuals and very healthy individuals, then there's, you're at risk of having over, uh, inflated uh, sensitivity and specificity estimates because it's very, it's much easier for a test to figure out whether someone who is very sick has a disease or someone who is very healthy doesn't have the disease. It's often much more difficult for a test to figure out all that gray area in between. That said, when you look at our single, if you just look at the epilepsy question, that single self-report screening question uh, for epilepsy, if you look at the sensitivity of it, according to our study, we found that it had a sensitivity of only 74%. This is very similar to the 76% reported by Altman. So this would suggest that, in fact, we weren't suffering from um, too much in terms of uh, spectrum effects that our, what, every improvement we demonstrate above this 74% was due to the questionnaire and algorithm that we used and less due to uh, problems such bias and such as spectrum effects. Our conclusion was that CSEA, the epilepsy algorithm, appears to have a higher sensitivity and specificity than other previously validated population-based instruments. That's one of the few to distinguish between active and the lifetime history of epilepsy. We have now a validated French language uh, instrument. In terms of future directions, uh, so I'm happy to say, uh, we found out, I think it was sometime last year, Tina may correct me, um, that it's been approved for inclusion into the CLSA. So that single question that I showed you uh, and earlier on that was in the CLSA previously was well, now going to be replaced with this algorithm beginning this summer the next wave. Um, and we now have plans also uh, to uh, develop uh, algorithms for migraine and um, we're looking at, although there's already been an algorithm that's been validated for Parkinsonism, we're uh, planning a systematic review to uh, look at what other algorithms have been validated in the past. Of course, our, <coughs> along with the acknowledgments, Tina Wilson, who is um, who I've worked with, in fact, we were recently reminiscing how we've worked together since I was a medical student over 10 years ago. Um, who was, of course, my supervisor throughout all this work uh, during the course of my master's. Natalie Jote, who was on my thesis supervisory committee, uh, who has also helped uh, work with us a lot on these uh, projects. Uh, Martin Veilleur at the Neuro, a number of research assistants, uh, and uh, actually one neurology resident to work with us as well. These are all the uh, funding agencies who have been involved. Thank you. Uh, Yes, thank you. Uh, Great, thank questions? you very much, Mark, for okay. this uh, very interesting presentation, especially for me since I have done some algorithm validation work as well. If there are any questions for Mark, please uh, type those questions using the chat feature and I will read them out to Mark and to the audience. While we're waiting for question, I have one question and Mark, that is, uh, as you were evaluating uh, the, the results and the performance of the algorithm. Uh, did it ever come up that the algorithm is intended for use in population-based studies, but most of your cases of epilepsy actually came from patients at the neuron? And 
only one of your epilepsy cases came from people who were enrolled in a population-based study. So uh, did that raise any concerns from uh, you or the research team? Um, that was actually uh, one of my uh, one of my bigger concerns uh, during this study uh, because, as a, uh, you know, I think this gets to the idea of spectrum effects. Um, that if you're using uh, cases from uh, a, a specialized medical setting, especially, then it's possible that you're going to end up with inflated sensitivity results. Um, ideally, we would have only used individuals uh, from the general population. We would have only reali uh, relied on uh, participants from the CLSA. Uh, unfortunately, uh, with the resources we had, this wasn't possible. Um, <clears throat> yes. Okay, so then um, would you say that in a study the sensitivity or specificity would be a little bit lower? It's possible. Um, I think that's why um, it was interesting to find that when we compared our the single question, the single epilepsy question, that, uh, when we compared the sensitivity that we found with that yeah. of Ottman, um, that it was interesting that they were very similar. So to this, to us, this suggested that in fact problems of spectrum effects weren't. Uh, there, it may not have been too great. It's impossible to say for sure, but this was a uh, sort of a, a clue that uh, maybe um, uh, things weren't too bad. I see, great. So I'm seeing that there are a couple of people typing in chat messages, so I imagine they might be um, typing in questions for you. While we're waiting for their questions to appear on chat, uh, just another quick question uh, about the identification of chronic disease in population-based studies. This is more of a general question. I don't know if, uh, if this was discussed by yourself and the research team, um, but uh, what might be some of the advantages of, I don't know, if you wanted to identify, for example, the incidence and prevalence of epilepsy or some other chronic disease, what might be some of the advantages of uh, a study like CLSA in that respect? The study of a chronic disease. Um, well, I, 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 I guess you're, you're, uh, it's the fact that it's population-based uh, is the, the advantage and its longitudinal nature that you're, you've identified a, a fixed cohort at the very beginning and that you can follow them over time uh, and uh, witness them as they, their diseases develop, as they evolve. Um, Yes, it's the, the advantage of being population-based. When you rely on a clinic, uh, for instance, to study chronic disease, there's a huge potential for all kinds of uh, selection. Um, uh, yes, um, I think that's the, the major advantage. Right, I would agree. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, a question, what about medications that are used both for epilepsy and other disorders? That uh, could that could have affected the performance of the questionnaire and um, algorithm, uh, certainly. And we could have added more to the question. Well, we could have added more to the questions to try and ensure that that wasn't the case. I should add that the specific question, if I remember correctly now, I don't have it in front of me, was have you ever been uh, on a medication uh, for seizures? So the design of the question itself should have uh, limited uh, sort of false positives uh, due to people taking, for instance, uh, pregabalin for uh, peripheral neuropathy or neuropathic pain rather than their epilepsy. Yes. That said, I mean, when you're designing these uh, these questionnaires, um, you can never make them perfect. Uh, you do your best, but you have to sort of uh, you have to make certain concessions as well to make them usable. And uh, so, in the end, you have to take what you have and see and see how it works. Uh, in, ter in the case of uh, the use of anti-epileptic drugs and um, uh, whether it's for non-epilepsy um, indications. 
with our algorithm, I think the chances that that would, cre even if the question weren't as specific as it is, that I think the chances that it would create false positives would be relatively low because you would have to not only answer incorrectly about the drug question, but you'd have to in answer incorrectly about the epilepsy question as well. So, um, yeah, so you, tra you use all, a few, I suppose, a few different strategies to try and control for that. Great. So another question. It says, thanks, Mark, for a great talk. Curious what your thoughts are about using the instrument as self-administered versus administered, as some population-based studies may not have the luxury of having an interviewer administer. Of course, yeah, when you're validating something, it's always uh, then valid for your specific circumstance, right? So any transportability of your findings to other situations, other scenarios, is you, you can't be certain how it's going to work. So uh, just uh, going from an uh, interviewer-administered questionnaire to a self-administered questionnaire, that can have an impact. Um, ideally, what you would do is you would, in fact, carry out another validation study to see how what impact it would have. Um, I don't think that any one validation, like doing a single validation study is sufficient uh, to, uh, that it doesn't say everything about any test that it's, it makes sense and often and sometimes it's very important to uh, repeat the validation study in different populations and you uh, administer it in different ways to see how it performs. But it could have an impact, it's true. And I think that some uh, algorithm questionnaires can probably be um, self-administered versus interview administered without any problem depending on the type of question. But I do agree that we would want to do validation to um, investigate whether there is uh, the same type of results are generated in one method versus another. Uh, another question, once the tool is included in the CLSA, how will you use these data? So I think first of all, of course, use it descriptively uh, to simply understand uh, the prevalence of both the lifetime history of epilepsy and active epilepsy. Uh, We'll also use it to enumerate a cohort. So to enumerate those people in the CLSA who are uh, affected uh, by this disease so that we then can carry out various other studies. Uh, there's an enormous amount of data that's being collected by the CLSA, uh, both cross-sectionally and then longitudinally. And so by using this, we hope that we have a better way of figuring out who has epilepsy so that we can then look at uh, what are uh, factors associated with their epilepsy? What are the things that, uh, what is the, what are, uh, uh, in terms of the prognosis of uh, epilepsy, what are comorbidities associated with their epilepsy, uh, and so forth? Um, it'll allow us to do that as well. Exactly, and I think that um, in a study as big as the CLSA, it's just not possible to send all of our participants to see specialist physicians to get uh, um, clinical diagnoses of well over 10 different types of chronic disease. Remember, we're measuring more in CLSA besides uh, epilepsy. So uh, we, we can't send all of our participants to 10 or 15 specialist physicians. So we need to use algorithms like this to um, obtain information on the presence or absence of disease. And I think, Mark, you're right. Uh, once we can identify people using this algorithm in CLSA as having or not having epilepsy, we can look at the prevalence of epilepsy, we can look at the incidence of epilepsy over time, and study risk factors for epilepsy. Uh, okay, so there's another couple of questions here. Um, would it be possible in the future to use data linkage with medical records in the CLSA to further validate the algorithm? Hmm. Uh, that's interesting. Well, the thing is, though, again, you would be using one surrogate to test another surrogate. So I'm not sure if you could do that, uh, because neither of them would be uh, the reference standard per se, because I, I have in mind that the data you'd be linking to would be administrative data, diagnostic ICD codes, for instance, which in and of themselves have uh, require validation, 
uh, have been validated uh, but aren't perfect, just like this algorithm. Uh, it would certainly be interesting to compare the two. In fact, it would be interesting if you compared, the, I suppose, the three. So you compared the, the algorithm to uh, ICD codes to uh, a clinical assessment. Um, yeah, it would be very interesting. Great, okay, thanks. Would you anticipate new cases of epilepsy over time in the CLSA, given that participants are already at least 45 years of age upon enrollment? Uh, yes, you would. Uh, there's actually a bimodal distribution to the incidence of epilepsy. So you have the smaller peak, in fact, is in uh, younger age groups. The larger peak is in older age groups. Uh, most common causes being uh, cerebrovascular disease and neuroge neurodegenerative disease, Alzheimer's disease, for instance. Um, so you would certainly expect uh, new cases in people aged over 45 years old. Great. Uh, so another question. Thank you, Mark, for this presentation. In the population that you screened, did you notice that there was a prompting effect of the questionnaire? so that people self-disclosed about unusual episodes in the past before you asked them. This question is not specific to your presentation, but is related to the CLSA and epilepsy. Uh, there seem to be a wide range of prevalence rates out there um, with respect to the uh, prevalence of epilepsy in seniors. Do you have a preferred estimate for epilepsy prevalence in people 65 or older? So I, this is a, a two-part question, yeah? So um, the first part is about a uh, prompting effect. This is very interesting. So, and this is, um, but this is more in reference to, I think, the questionnaire itself and when it was administered. I didn't administer the questionnaires, right? They were administered by a research assistant. It was, in, it was actually important that I wasn't aware of how each individual responded to the questionnaire. Um, when it came to the questionnaire, the idea was that they were read out in a very dry, not, not overly dry, but in a somewhat controlled manner and so that it was reproducible, so that it was standardized the way these questions were asked of each individual. Um, so if they had started self-disclosing additional fa uh, facts and so forth, that, that I don't think should have had much of an impact on the questionnaire. For me, as the reference standard, yes, sometimes people would self-disclose all, uh, all sorts of things, but uh, I wasn't too worried about that because uh, our reference standard, our gold standard for the diagnosis, is a clinical diagnosis. And uh, so it was very, I did my best to carry out what I would have considered, what I consider a normal sort of clinical interview, uh, that, which would include, of course, spontaneous uh, things that the patient, may, the participant may say versus what I had asked them directly. Um, the second question is, there seems to be a wide prevalence of rates, uh, so uh, prevalence of epilepsy in seniors. Do I have a preferred estimate for epilepsy prevalence in people 65 and older? Um, hmm. That's interesting. I don't have a preferred number. Of course, you have to see between lifetime history and active. Uh, in fact, I'd have to look back, I'd have to refer to uh, a primary source to know whether it would be any different than what I usually quote, which is 0.5% for active epilepsy and 1% for lifetime history of epilepsy. Great. So I can't give a better answer than that. Great. So there's one person saying thank you for the great and informative talk. And um, another thank you. And one last question, because we're already just a little bit over. So this will be our last question. Have you thought of adding the question, is there anyone in your family history that is known or was known to have active epilepsy or had epilepsy at some point in their life? So a uh, family history question. Uh, no, we hadn't thought about adding that. Uh, it would have been something to consider. Um, we did uh, do a, a, we were, uh, when we were deciding on what we were going to use in this questionnaire, we felt it was best to use an already existing instrument uh, and to build upon that uh, because it, in a way that reduced the number of unknown variables, right? Uh, and so uh, that would have, adding a question like that would have meant adding something to the, uh, something additional um, uh, to the uh, Ottman questionnaire 
that may, without a, 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 an extremely expressed uh, uh, purpose. Uh, we added other questions like the medication one, we, uh, well, not so much the medication one, but more than one for active epilepsy, but that was for a very specific purpose because it was something that was clearly missing in the original one. But um, we, would, we would have been reluctant to add something like uh, the family history question to the Otten questionnaire. Great. Thank you very much, Mark, for this excellent presentation. I enjoyed it, and I'm sure everybody else did. Uh, very informative and always interesting to, uh, just personally speaking, to see um, other people doing work that was similar to some of the work that I've done. So, again, thank you so much for uh, agreeing to present today. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you for having me by me. Great. And we're getting a few more thank yous. Interesting webinar. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. So uh, certainly the audience seems to appreciate it. And just before we sign off, uh, a bit of a plug for our next CLSA webinar. It's going to be May 14th from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern Time. Verena Menick from University of Manitoba will be presenting a webinar on age-supportive environments and healthy aging. Uh, this presentation is going to highlight some of Verena's program of research into age-friendly communities. So uh, that will be interesting. We look forward to that. And we thank Mark again. Thank you. And thanks, everyone, for joining us today. And we hope to see you in a month. And enjoy the rest of the day and the nice weather. Bye now.